This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. So let's start with the case. This is an 80-year-old man with a long-standing hypermature cataract with pseudo exfoliation. The pupil is not dilating well enough and we can see that there is a lot of sphincter atrophy, deposition of pseudo exfoliation material all around. The lens appears to be slightly swollen. I can see these calcific spots in the capsule. Looking at this case, I needed to plan it very well to meet multiple challenges in this case. So number one would be to deal with the pupil. Number two would be to deal with the capsule and do the rexis all right. Because my major concern in this patient is going to be the zonular health. The patient has a long-standing hypermature cataract along with pseudo exfoliation. So it is expected the zonules could have been compromised. And lastly, dealing with a slightly denser nucleus which is also mobile. There is lack of epinuclear cushion. And we also expect the bag to be very loose and the posterior capsule can be trampolining. So these are the multiple challenges which are in my mind as I am planning the surgery in this case. These are the things which I got it ready. A dispersive OVD, cohesive OVD, pupil expansion device of BX ring, iris hooks as well, capsule hooks as well, capsule tension ring, multi-piece intraocular lens and also iris clip lens if the need arises. And of course, I'm also ready with the anti-vitrectomy unit as well. So this is how the things are planned. So with all these things and the planning ready, let's see how things turn out. This is going to be a slightly long video. If you would prefer, you can see it in a slightly higher speed version to save some time. But I would suggest you to watch the video till the end so that you get a few important learning points. I make the side port. The anti-capsule is stained. I'm using dispersive OVD first, followed by cohesive OVD. Contrary to the clear corneal incision, I'm planning a sclerocorneal incision here. So a 2.8 millimeter incision is made, but it, the incision starts at the sclera about 1 to 1.5 millimeter behind the limbus. The idea is if a situation arises where I need to convert it into a small incision cataract surgery or I need to introduce a rigid iris clip lens, I could use this uh, same incision to create a scleral tunnel. The incision is created, followed by cohesive OVD just to lift up the iris a little bit so that I can use my Y hooks to stretch the pupil without damaging the anti-capsule. Stretching is typically done in four directions and I'm trying to create some amount of uh, spring to tear here which would enhance pupillary expansion when I use PHEX device. PHEX device is introduced into the antechamber and the notches are then engaged into the pupillary margin. We have a pupillary dilatation of about 5 mm. I think this should be enough to manage this case and although if situation demands or if something worse happens, I still have iris hooks as standby. I puncture the anterior capsule using a 26 number needle so that I can get a clean cut because I don't expect the capsule to be very healthy here. With the forceps, the rexus is begun and as expected, liquid cortex flows out into the antechamber, obscuring the visualization. As I'm trying to tear the capsule, I can see these folds in the antecapsule, a peripheral to the area where I'm aiming to tear at and this is an alarming sign. So I stop there at that moment come out. I'm injecting cohesive OVD into the antechamber to clear off all the liquid lens matter, the visualization improves. But more importantly, I'm putting the OVD into the bag itself. Uh, this gives an artificial strength to the zonules in the quadrant and strengthen them so that I can have enough counter traction to get their excess in. So that is what I'm hoping and that is the idea of injecting this cohesive OVD into the bag. It acts like an artificial temporary zonules just to strengthen it and make it a little bit taut so that the tearing is much more easier. So let's find out whether this idea works here. As we can see this, the idea works. So I could get a good grasp on the capsule and the capsule tore and we're not able to see any of the folds in this region now. So I have a rexus which is around 4 millimeter. 
Now let's understand the most important principle here. This is the most crucial step in the surgery. I want to stabilize the bag before enlarging the rexus. So the whole idea of creating a small rexus was to allow me to introduce a CTR which is going to stabilize the bag, add strength to the zonules and then only I can enlarge the rexus in a very controlled manner. So this is the most important step in this case. This would ensure that we don't lose the bag. So let's see how things go. So again, I'm filling the bag with OVD and threading in a CTR. The moment we push in a CTR and a care is taken that the CTR supports the suspected weak area and ensure that it is well supported. So what it does basically is that it acts like an artificial zonules and the enlargement of the rexus becomes much more easier and safer. I'm giving a tangential cut with a micro scissors and then the rexus is enlarged. Since the bag is stabilized with the ring and we have a decent sized rexus, uh, my decision was going more in favor of fake emulsification. I thought I could manage this pretty well. So I have abandoned the idea of uh, doing SICS in this case at this stage and I am backing myself to perform a fake emulsification. So I am expecting the bag to be well supported, uh, hopefully, and let's see how things go here. Uh, during emulsifying the nucleus, there are going to be a few challenges in this eye because Although the bag is supported well by the ring, the posterior capsule and in general the bag will be very flimsy. A higher flow rate and vacuum would more likely catch the trampolining posterior capsule so I need to be aware of it. And also uh, dividing the nucleus is going to be challenging this patient because it's going to be free floating and I'm just thinking now whether to use the vertical chop or the horizontal chop technique and let's see how things go. I begin by creating a central trench by sculpting it. So these are the sculpt settings. Please note that my chopper is supporting the nucleus so that it doesn't move around and I don't induce any stress on the loose bag. So I'm using maximum power to get a small central trench so that I can bury and hold the nucleus very well for my chopping maneuvers. I'm aiming for a depth of about say 60 to 70% and I think this is it. Now I'm going to change over to the chop settings and uh, my initial plan is to continue with the vertical chop which I do for most of my cases may and then take a call. I bury my FACO tip and I'm using a sharp chopper to do a vertical chop in this case. Suddenly there is a torque in the nucleus and it doesn't look to be safe anymore. So quickly I change my decision. I decide to abandon vertical chop and go in with the horizontal chopping technique. I'm getting my Chang chopper and I'm going to try out the horizontal chopping technique in this case. The Chang chopper's length is quite long as we are aware and it has got a hook like. So because we're dealing with a capsule which is totally exposed underneath the nucleus, there's no epinucleus. So I'm very concerned about, you know, not touching the posterior capsule because already it's very thin and friable. So I'm budding the phaco tip into the nucleus, pulling it slightly towards the incision so that the equator of the nucleus is exposed and I am able to introduce the chopper around the equator of the nucleus under direct visualization. Because the size of the nucleus is also slightly smaller, this being a Morgagnian cataract, it does help. In spite of having a small pupil, I could do the equatorial chop under direct visualization. So that increase the safety margin. A second thing which I'm doing is I'm also lifting up the nucleus a little bit so that my chopper is relatively away from the posterior capsule. The physics of the horizontal chop suggests that there is less stress in the vertical meridian but more horizontally, meaning that the amount of stress which is induced anterior posteriorly that is towards the posterior capsule is significantly lesser because the movement of the chopper is towards the main incision, it's more in the horizontal meridian. So I could get a crack quite effortlessly without any torque in the nucleus, but the central posterior plate will be still sticking on. Attempting lateral separation just a bit to break the posterior plate, and I'm partially successful, but I don't pursue it for long. I rotate the nucleus and then begin chopping at the first heminucleus. 
the phaco tip is buried into the nucleus and the nucleus is pulled again towards me so that i want to see the equator before introducing my chopper so i want to do all these maneuvers and direct visualization because the pupillary expansion is not great and there is no epinuclear support so i need to be as careful and as cautious as possible the chop is very successful and i have a first free fragment here i'm not going to remove the fragment it's going to be there in the bag itself so that it acts like a support system to the bag itself because the chances of the bag trampolining is minimized subsequently the next part of the hemi nucleus again is divided by using the horizontal chop technique in a similar manner which was described earlier the third fragment of the first hemi nucleus is still attached to the other hemi nucleus at the base i'm unable to separate it so i decide to consume the small piece i'm changing my settings to the quadrant removal mode and uh, the flow rate in the vacuum are significantly lesser than what i would have used usually and just to minimize the turbulence and be a little bit more in control and be a little bit slow so the idea of eating of this piece is that we can get rid of that uh, small fragment and its attachment to the posterior plate itself without inducing any stress uh, during lateral separation so the plan works and the small fragment is eaten out time to deal with the second hemi nucleus now there is a lot of more open space so i can really pull the hemi nucleus back and i can see the equator very well enough and then use the chopper to divide it into two halves during fragment removal please note the settings my typical aspiration flow rate setting is around 40 cc per minute and vacuum is around 600 but in this case i've consciously reduced it to 30 and 500 again the whole motive is to go a little bit more slower so that i can be in control and by reducing the flow rate you know you're risking a little bit lesser the chances of the thin posterior capsule getting caught into your phaco tip is minimized There's a lot of viscoelastic also inside the chamber which also slows down the, the effective flow rate so being slow and steady is going to be the main mantra in such cases a uh, time to refill the ovds first the dispersive ovd goes in followed by hpmc underneath it into the bag i have switched my chopper with sinski hook as my second instrument now The second instrument job is to just act as a supporting unit to prevent the fragments from coming out and into the enter chamber. What I've realized is that the pupillary plane or the iris plane has come up a little bit and I think I'm working a little bit more anterior. So I'm really concerned about the endothelial damage. So there's a reason I am trying to work as posterior as possible. as i'm refilling the ovd again i'm reminding myself the case is still far from over so when you're trying to emulsify the last few fragments there is always a tendency for the bag to come out so i'm just reminding myself at this stage the case is still not done so time to deal with the last two fragments the two fragments are hidden under the pupil so i manipulate one of them into the visual axis using a sinski hook and then i begin emulsifying it as the emulsification is being done of this fragment i'm very much focused on keeping it below the pupillary margin so i don't want it to be flying around and coming into the anterior chamber i have asked my assistant to remind me that at, after the consumption of each fragment i need to put in ovd in time to deal with the last fragment the last fragment was also emulsified quite easily so the nucleus emulsification was uneventful so far so good let me confess that it is quite stressful for me to finish this emulsification the bag is again filled with ovd in time to remove the cortex very little of it is there and in such cases this cortex will be very sticky and it will be sticking onto the bag itself very difficult to remove I'm using my irrigation handpiece to retract the 
iris so that I can see well and I'm trying to aspirate this cortex into direct visualization. So that's the key here, you know, because these bags will be very loose. So all the hard work which you have done until now can all be of waste if we just lose the bag at this stage. And there is a great propensity for it to happen also because the cortex will be very sticky. And if you just make one move which is not wise, the entire hard work which you have done until now is going to be lost. Time to put in the lens. The original lens which was planned was the multi-piece hydrophobic lens itself. So the same lens is going into the bag. Now both the proximal and the distal haptics are into the bag and the lens is very well centered. Now before removing the OVD, I want to remove the BHEX pupillary expansion device. And it comes off very easily. Time to remove the OVD. Now because I have used a cohesive OVD here, it comes out a little bit quicker. The wounds are hydrated. That's it, the case is done. Now, these are the first day post-op pictures. Now let's summarize the key moments in this surgery. In such cases, the half the battle is won if we anticipate certain things and plan accordingly. So we anticipated all the problems of uh, a difficult rexus, zonular weakness and difficult nucleus management and we had strategies ready to deal with each of these situations. So planning was uh, meticulous in this case and that was half the battle won. The pupil was dealt with first and once we had a clearer visualization then we could really see the area where the zonules were weak and then tailor or alter our plan accordingly. So I modified my plan and did a smaller excess initially, put in a CTR to stabilize the bag and then did a bigger excess. So this was probably the most critical step. Once we had a good excess and a CTR into the bag, then the subsequent steps are going to be much more easier and safer. And lastly, nucleus management is going to be a challenge in such situations because we don't have any support and the posterior capsule is totally exposed. So in such situations, you need to choose the right technique. In this case, initially I went ahead and tried the vertical chop. Deciding on the right chopping technique was very critical. I immediately realized that vertical chop might not be the best way to split the nucleus. I shifted over to horizontal chop technique and ensured that the chopper hooked the equator of the nucleus under direct visualization. This being a Morgagnian cataract and a smaller nucleus, it did help. But I wanted to do most of the things under direct visualization that helps. And lastly, during quadrant removal, I ensured that the pace of the surgery was slowed down significantly because this ensured that there is absolutely no chance for the posterior capsule to trampoline or there's no chance of the bag getting caught into the phaco probe. Slowing down the parameters of aspiration flow rate and the vacuum did help to control the surgery much well. So once the nucleus was managed, everything else was easy. But before I conclude, I would want to confess something. I experienced quite a significant amount of stress during the nucleus management. Uh, although things went on very well and it was absolutely fine. But maybe if I had a second chance, Looking at the, the situation, once the brexis is done, bag is stabilized, and, well, I would definitely consider SICS in a more serious way because it would have really finished the job much more earlier without causing any stress to the capsule bag or the surgeon and the results wouldn't have been dramatically different. I think that was something which uh, I'm honestly feeling at the end of the surgery. So that was it. Thank you for watching and hope you found this helpful.